Welcome back to the channel. This is Trendy Storm, and you are watching eighth part of What If Naruto Became Wielder of a Universal Weapon. If you enjoy this video, please like, share, and subscribe to the channel. Now, wasting no more time, let's start the story. Naruto, Idate, and the girls ran as fast as they could along the dirt path until they reached the Torii gates. But what they saw beyond the gates stopped them in their tracks. Dang, how many stairs do you have to climb all the way to the top? As Naruto had just mentioned, there was a very long flight of stairs leading all the way to the top of the great Madoroki Shrine. No one knows, which is one of the reasons they call it the Spirit Breaker, Idate explained. That sounds like a challenge, and I'm going to conquer it. Smirked Naruto. Hey, we'll see about that, Idate dashed up the stairs, Naruto close behind. Hanada and Sakura were exhausted as they watched the two boys ascend the stairs. I always forget not to underestimate his endurance, Sakura sighed. He's always been that way, Sakura-chan, Hanada explained. I know, makes me wonder if we'll be able to keep up with him once we get married to him, he might wear us out, Sakura teased, prompting Hanada to withdraw into her shell by pulling her hood up over her head to hide her blush. Naruto and Idate were running up the stairs when Idate called out to the blonde, Hey Naruto, I have a question for you. What is it? Naruto inquired. Did you come across anything like a tenth and final question that came out of nowhere when taking the Chunin exam? Yes, my group and I did. It was difficult because the point of the question was whether you wanted to answer it or not, given the conditions for the choice that you make. Yeah. I ran into the same question three years ago when I took the Chunin exams, Idate explained. How did you find it? Well. Flashback begin. Idate sat in the examination room with the other candidates, waiting for the final part of the first stage of the Chunin exam, which Morino Ibiki stood before them. All right, now for the tenth and final question, Ibiki said. All right, big brother. What trick did you have up your sleeve this time? Idate wondered. This time, you're competing not only against the other genin here, but also against your own teammates. I'm talking about competing against your own squad. Whoever scores the lowest in your squad will fail, and the one who fails will never take the Chunin exams again and will remain a genin for life. That's crazy. Going up against our own teammates? That goes against every rule of, exclaimed a random genin. In here, I am the rules, and there is nothing you can do about it, Ibiki cut him off. If anyone wishes to withdraw, now is the time. If you choose to quit, the members of your squad will be disqualified, but you will still be eligible to take the exams again in six months. The participants rose from their seats one by one and left, with several others following, while a few chose to remain. Idate among them. With a 1 in 3 chance of being thrown out for good, I should be able to beat those odds, but that means one of my squad will be a genin for life. Should I go for it? Idate pondered. So no one else is leaving? Ibiki asked, looking around. Alright then, to those of you who have chosen to stay, I have one word for you. You failed. Everyone was stunned before leaping from their seats and yelling at Ibiki, except Idate, who was simply stunned. How can you say we failed? Exclaimed one of the genin. Are you punishing us for being bold enough to take the tenth question? Exclaimed another. You're so certain that you'd sacrifice the future of one of your own squad members, none of you deserve to be Chunin for such a decision. You're dismissed. Ibiki said before exiting the examination hall. End of flashback. Wow, that's really something, Naruto exclaimed. I wonder how you would have answered that question if you had encountered it, Shinami said. So, what was the question he threw at you guys? Idate inquired. Well, the question was whether one is willing to risk everything, including the lives of his squad, to obtain information that, if true, could lead to victory for your village, 
but if false, would result in the death of your squad members and the destruction of the village, Naruto explained. Whoa, that's completely different from what I've seen, Idate exclaimed in awe. Especially when we had to cheat to answer the previous questions without being caught by the invigilators, Naruto said. All I know is that I trusted my brother and he let me down, that I trusted him and he ruined my life forever, she says. I don't think that's the case. I can tell he was looking out for you but doesn't want to coddle you because it would appear that he was playing favorites among the ranks, Naruto said. What exactly do you mean? Perhaps you should think back on what he said to you. From what I've seen of him, he tends to hide what he truly means beneath his words, Naruto said, leaving Idate to run silently beside him. Soon after, the duo arrived at the top of the stairs, where a large crowd cheered loudly upon seeing Idate. Ahead of them was the great Madaroki shrine, which contained a stone pedestal with a blue orb on it and a hollowed out part next to it. Does your body have any issues? Naruto inquired. None at all, thanks to your summon. I'll get the Ryuko jewel, then we'll catch up with Fukus and overtake him, Idate said. And you can leave Aoi to me, Naruto added. Idate dashed forward, grabbing the Ryuko jewel, while Naruto wrote a message on the trans scroll to Sakura and Hanada, informing them that they were still moving forward. You know the girls aren't going to be happy about this, Kurama predicted. I know, but we can't afford to wait with that runner from the Wagarashi clan ahead of us, Naruto reasoned as they continued on their way. Meanwhile, Fukusk stands in front of a long rope bridge that has been built across a deep valley to the other side. Once I cross the bridge, I'll be over at Uzo Island, Fukusk said, before Aoi landed next to him with a frown. Then you should hurry over to the other side because Idate has already made it to the Madaroki Shrine and is on his way here, Aoi said. What? I thought you said you'd look after him. Fukusk yelled angrily. Yes, but the Wasabi clan's head had apparently hired some very capable ninja to guard Idate, so get going while there's still time. Humph. Fukusk exclaimed before his shoulder was grabbed and he was forced to turn around as Aoi grabbed him by the neck and lifted him into the air. Now you listen here, I'm here helping you because it's my duty, but one more little crack like that and I'll break you in half, Aoi threatened. Oh okay, sorry. I'm sorry. Fukusk exclaimed before being thrown to the ground. Alright, now get moving, Aoi said. Alright. Fukus jumped to his feet and dashed across the rope bridge, while Aoi used the body flicker jutsu to vanish from view. Naruto and Idate were running along the path when they noticed Fukusk running across the rope bridge. There he is, we're almost there, Idate said. When Naruto heard Shinami call out to him urgently, he immediately perked up. Naruto sama, an incoming attack is heading straight for Idate san. Naruto lunged forward and yanked Idate back while moving forward and drawing out the Mumi no Tamanu in time to block an attack, then jumping backwards with a frown on his face. I was wondering when you'd show up, Aoi, Naruto said. I knew you were expecting me, so I didn't want to disappoint you, Naruto Uzumaki Namikaze, Konoha's weapon master. Rumors say you carry mysterious weapons within that bracelet on your hand and it appears that Iwa has put quite a bounty on your head just for being related to their most despised enemy, Aoi smirked. Idate was taken aback by Naruto's revelation, you mean you're the Yandaimi's son? Well, I didn't get these good looks from any other blonde, you know. I was wondering when they were going to put my name on the bingo book after the invasion, Naruto smirked, pointing to his face. I'm sure the ninjas of Iwagakir will be very happy once I bring your body over to them. Not only will I become rich, but my ranking in the bingo book will rise, Aoi sneered. Do I need to remind you what happened the last time we fought? Naruto asked, quirking his brow. Oh, I haven't forgotten at all, which is why I came prepared, Aoi held out something familiar to Idate but new to Naruto. Aoi was holding the hilt of what appeared to be a Vajra-style sword, 
But instead of a steel blade, the blade glowed bright yellow and appeared to be infused with pure electrical energy, which was emanating from the crossguard and making a humming sound. That's the Thunder God's sword! exclaimed Idate. Of course you'd recognize it, after all, you were the one who stole from me, Aoi sneered. That sword was once wielded by the Nidem, and it made him extremely dangerous on the battlefield, especially when combined with his water jutsus, Kurama explained. Now then, why don't you bring out that spear of yours and let's see whose weapon is the strongest? Aoi smugly held out the region. To think you used someone as innocuous as Idate to steal one of Konoha's most valuable relics, I'll be returning it to its rightful place, Naruto said as he held the Mumi no Tamanu. Naruto charged forward and slashed Aoi, who raised the Reijin to block the incoming strike. Electricity crackled from the blade as they collided. Naruto stepped away from the fight with a one-handed backflip to gain some distance from his opponent. Take this, lightning wave. Aoi slashed at Naruto, sending out a crescent wave of lightning. Wind style. Wind cutter. Naruto sped through a series of hand seals, then wind gathered to his left hand and swirled around it, causing him to swing his arm, launching a crescent wave of air. Both waves clashed and struggled for dominance, but Naruto's jutsu won out with the elemental advantage and broke through as it shot straight towards Aoi, who dodged to the side. My turn, secret arts, specter blow. He said as he raised the blade into the air, five purple orbs shooting out from it and homed in on the target. Aoi launched the Raijin into the air and discharged massive amounts of electricity from the blade, destroying the purple orbs in the process. He grabbed the umbrella from his back and flung it into the air, exclaiming, Ninja art, Senbon shower. The umbrella spun quickly before firing a volley of needles at Naruto. Secret Arts, Moonlit Glint Naruto quickly sheathed the Mumi no Tamanu and drew it out again, unleashing multiple slashes all around him, deflecting the needles and severing the umbrella. Naruto dashed forward, launching a barrage of slashes at Aoi, who was deflecting some of the attacks before retaliating with his own. Both opponents jumped away from each other, both with wounds from the other's attacks, though it appears that Aoi took the brunt of it. I'm impressed that a chunin like you could keep up with a junin like me for so long, though your sword appears to be breaking with the next few strikes, which is to be expected of the Raijin, which can cut through anything even a Muramasa blade, Aoi smirked. Everyone could see numerous chips on the edge of the Mumi no Tamanu, and Naruto frowned slightly before returning the blade to its sheath to repair itself. To think a sword like the Raijin is in the hands of scum like him, it's a complete insult to the Nidam, Naruto reflected as he hesitated to draw out the Tsukiyotoshi due to its slow speed and suffering from the same conditions as the Mumi no Tamanu. Chinami-san, is there any weapon I could use that could match up to the Raijin? Give me a moment. Chinami closed her eyes in concentration as she scoured the archives for the most appropriate weapon for her master finally locating the information on just the one. I found one Naruto-sama, it is a powerful weapon which is only allowed to be wielded by the elite group of an organization that follows the ways of the shinobi which was once created to oppose a force that sought to conquer the world by force. The words to call upon it are. Naruto listened to Chinami's words before raising the bracelet and channeling his chakra into it as he called out, running across fields. The bracelet glowed brightly, causing everyone to close their eyes before fading away, and it was at this point that Hanada and Sakura arrived to see the weapon Naruto was now holding. Naruto wields a broadsword with a pointed tip, but it has a short handle perpendicular to the main handle, giving the impression of a tonfa. He also wears a metal gauntlet with a red core on his left arm, as well as small devices attached to the heels of his ninja sandals, but the long flowing scarf around his neck stands out because it appears to be made entirely of crimson energy. What kind of weapon is that? Idate inquired. We don't know Idate san but he should be able to defeat Aoi now, Sakura said. Allow me to introduce you to the Cypher Blade, a weapon only wielded by the elite of the Striders. Naruto pulled up his face mask and took a stance similar to the weapon's previous owner. 
Let's see if this so-called sword of yours can outperform your Muramasa blade, Aoi sneered, before swinging the Raijin over her in an arc to create several rings of electricity and launching them at Naruto. The red energy scarf flared slightly as the cipher blade was covered in the same energy. Naruto held the blade ready as the electric rings approached. Reflect cipher. He slashed at the first ring, knocking it off course, and repeated the process with the second and third rings. When the last ring was almost on him, he slashed it, sending it flying back to a stunned Aoi, who used Raijin to absorb the reflected projectile. Aoi willed the Raijin to emit crackles of lightning to shock Naruto, but the cipher blade was unaffected, and when Naruto jumped away, Aoi was surprised to see that the blade appeared completely undamaged. How come your sword hasn't been damaged by the Raijin? Aoi demanded. That's because the cipher blade generates high voltage plasma particles, making it capable of cutting through just about anything, and when two swords capable of cutting through anything clash, they pretty much cancel each other out, Naruto explained. We'll see. Aoi reared the Raijin and swung it forward, launching another lightning wave. Naruto positioned the cipher blade behind him, judging by the increasing brightness, then spun around and slashed at the electric projectile, completely dissipating it. He quickly closed in on his opponent and prepared to slash him. Aoi thrust the Raijin forward in an attempt to stab him, but Naruto saw it coming and activated the devices on his heels before performing a slide across the ground with one of his legs sticking forward to kick. Aoi saw the attack coming and jumped into the air to avoid it, but he had a gut feeling he made a serious mistake, which was confirmed when Naruto dug his heels in the ground to lift himself up and performed a somersault back flip in the opposite direction of Aoi. Savage Slash Naruto did a rolling somersault and then spread his arms apart, causing multiple slashes to appear around him, inflicting massive damage on Aoi as numerous cuts appeared on both his body and gear. Happy Landings He somersaulted again and slammed a heel drop kick, sending Aoi crashing to the ground. Both the plasma scarf and the cipher blade abruptly changed color from crimson red to bright yellow. Downstrike Explosive Cipher he gripped the main handle with both hands before descending with the intent to impale. Aoi rolled to the side just in time to avoid the blade as it stabbed into the ground, but he wasn't prepared for when the area around Naruto suddenly exploded and rocks flew in all directions, pelting him. It's incredible that he can beat Aoi so easily even with the Raijin, Idate said. Naruto-kun has always worked very hard to become that strong, Sakura explained and his desire to protect the people he cares about drives him to train harder. Naruto-kun is always willing to put his life on the line for them, Hanada said with a warm smile. Puts his life before the lives of others. Idate's thoughts wandered back to when he took the Chunin exams and remembered the final question, could this be what Big Brother was aiming for when he asked that question? Naruto stood there intently watching as Aoi struggled to his feet and the electric blade on the Raijin flickered as if about to go out. Now's my chance to get the Raijin, Naruto thought as the plasma scarf and cipher blade changed color from bright yellow to deep purple. Magnetic Cipher Cipher Boomerang He yelled as he reared his arm back and quickly threw the cipher blade at Aoi as it spun like a disc. When Aoi saw the incoming projectile, he sneered, what's the point of that when you know I can simply avoid it? He dashed to the side just as the cipher blade flew by, but the Raijin was suddenly wrenched from his grip, and he watched in shock as the prized weapon floated after the blade, which returned to Naruto, who caught both in each hand with a smirk on his face. How was that possible? Aoi yelled, furious and defiant. If you were listening to what I said earlier, I changed the plasma into one with magnetic properties so when I threw it, the strong magnetic attraction was too much for the Raijin to resist, resulting in me getting the blade and you weaponless," Naruto replied while placing the Raijin in his pouch and sheathing the cipher blade to the back of his waist. When Naruto extended his hand, Chakra gathered around it and began to spin rapidly before solidifying into a blue spinning orb. 
Then a piece of the reverted plasma scarf flowed into the sphere, changing its color from blue to crimson. I wasn't expecting that, but I don't mind the mix, Naruto admitted, despite his surprise. Aoi took a few steps back, fear in his eyes, before fleeing into the woods, saying, like hell, I'm going to let you hit me with whatever jutsu that is. And who says I'm going to let you go? Naruto activated the gauntlet on his left arm, which opened up and shot out a thin red beam of light. He aimed the beam at Aoi, then took off in the form of a crimson streak with a loud bang. He quickly caught up and was directly in front of him. Take this. Plasma Rasengan. Naruto rammed the spinning sphere into Aoi's gut, surprised to see the technique easily burn through the skin as it grinded against it before sending Aoi flying over the edge of the cliff and into the valley below, death his ultimate destination. Naruto approached the group as the cipher blade and the equipment vanished in a flash of light, signaling that they had returned to the bracelet, though he was taken aback by what had happened earlier with his Rasengan. I never expected that to happen, Chinami-san, do you have any ideas? thought Naruto. If you remember what I told you back in Wave Country, this weapon must have wanted to help you in some way, Chinami explained. Yeah, well, I'm grateful for its assistance, but now we should focus on more serious matters, Naruto reflected as he approached Hanada, Sakura, and Idate. Are you okay, Naruto-kun? Hanada inquired, concerned. I'm fine, Aoi has been dealt with, and I recovered the region. Naruto said as he turned to face Idate. I've done my part and cleared the path of all obstacles, so it's all up to you now, he said. Thank you Naruto, I'm definitely going to win this race, not only for the boss or the wasabi but also for you guys, Idate said as he reached into his leg warmers and pulled out the leg weights before dropping them to the ground as he dashed off much faster across the bridge and towards the finish line at the great Todoroki shrine. A massive crowd gathered on either side of a very long stone tiled road leading into the main building where Ryuko jewels were to be placed and also signify the winner of the race, as well as where the heads of the Wasabi clan and the Wagarashi clan waited for their runners. There were murmurs and frowns instead of cheers and smiles as they watched Fukusk of the Wagarashi clan casually jog down the road towards the goal. Oh no, the Wagarashi are going to win again, one of the spectators exclaimed. Where is the Wasabi clan runner? Inquired another. Hey almost at the shrine and Idate is a mile away from here, I always knew that I had this race in the bag, and I'm pretty sure that my boss is going to reward me for this despite the crowd not even cheering for me, Fukusk smirked as he approached the shrine. To Fukuski's surprise, the audience began to cheer loudly. Look who's coming. It's Idate from the Wasabi clan. He turned to look behind him and gaped in surprise as he saw Idate running at full speed towards him. Idate. Jirocho exclaimed joyfully when he saw the boy. What the hell are you doing, Fukusk? Run faster! exclaimed Kyoroku, the Wagarashi clan's leader. Fukusk moved forward, as if hearing him, increasing his speed to close the gap between him and the pursuing Idate. I'm not going to lose, after coming all the way. Idate lowered himself to the ground to reduce wind pressure and gain speed. I'm putting everything I've got into this final dash to win this for everyone. Sure enough, Idate had caught up to Fukusk and they were running neck and neck as they approached the finish line. I'm not going to lose to you after coming all this way, you little runt! exclaimed Fukusk, gaining speed. Come on, Idate, you can do it! Jirocho exclaimed. Boss. You're right, I can go faster. 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 Idate exclaimed as he willed his legs to run faster than ever before, overtaking and pulling ahead of Fukusk and crossing the finish line. The crowd erupted as they gathered to celebrate the Wasabi clan's victory and freedom from the Wagarashi clan. Despite his exhaustion, Idate entered the shrine and placed the blue Ryuko jewel on the prepared pedestal before collapsing on his back and smiling. Well done, 
Idate, you've made me and the Wasabi clan very proud of you, Jirocho said as he approached Idate, smiling. I gave you my word that you could count on me, boss, and that also went for Naruto and the others because they helped me come all the way here, Idate said. Very well said, my boy. Go on. They're waiting for you because it's your day after all. Later, Idate stood on top of a small wooden platform, and everyone cheered for him. Naruto, Hanada, and Sakura had arrived a few minutes earlier, and they were smiling as they watched. And the winner is Idate Morino, Wasabi clan representative. Exclaimed the judge. Hold on. Everyone turned to see Kiyoroku and one of the chief counselors, an elderly man. What is it? Jirocho inquired. It appears that the kid was carried by a group of hired ninja, which is against the rules, and I have proof, Kiyoroku said, pulling out a photograph of Naruto and the girls carrying Idate from the beach's shores. They have to make it here by their own strength, those are the rules of this race, the chief counselor said, so the boy must be disqualified, which means Fukusk of the Wagarashi is the winner. When Naruto heard what they said, he scowled, that can't be right, I've never heard of such a rule, did you Sakura-chan? No, I didn't, I haven't read anything like that in the rulebook, Sakura frowned. Those Cretans, they're trying to find a way to cheat despite their defeat, Kurama raged. Such behavior violates all aspects of honor in any kind of competition, Chinami said. Wait a minute, that's because I... Idate explained. I won't hear any excuses from you, Jirocho, you gave your own that if you lose the race, the Wasabi clan will be disbanded, smirked the chief counselor. Wait a minute, there was no such rule, so stop talking nonsense, a man in regal attire strode up to them, frowning. But, my lord. But the district leader interrupted him, saying, but what do you mean? Are you suggesting that I allow the Wagarashi simply because you want it? Of course not, I say. Perhaps you wanted them to win because it would put an end to all the bribes you've been taking, look here, the district leader took out a photograph of the chief counselor receiving gold bars in his parlor, the said person paled in fear upon seeing the photograph, you ignoramus. You'll give up your position and don a monk's robe. Yes, sir. How about you? Kiyoroku. Yes? Kiyoroku backed up in fear. I've heard a lot about your evil deeds, your crimes against the people of Port Degarashi are unforgivable, and the Wagarashi clan is no longer, is that clear? Kiyoroku knelt in despair, yes sir. It appears that karma has finally caught up with them, Naruto smirked. Ho 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 an auspicious day we will now consider this matter ended. Exclaimed the district leader, and the crowd cheered even louder than before. Later that day, at sunset, Naruto and the girls were standing at the port, waving goodbye to Jirocho and Idate. I really want to thank you all for your assistance, Idate said. Don't bring it up, I was happy to help despite our rocky start, Naruto smirked. I hope to see you again, Jirocho said. Of course, Jirocho-san, if any assistance is required, we'll be happy to help, Hanada said. Naruto. If you see my brother, could you please tell him that I'm fine and that I finally understood what the tenth question meant? Idate asked. Sure thing, and I've got something even better in mind, Naruto reached into his ninja pouch and pulled out a small scroll, handing it to him. Take this and you can send a message once I've given Ibiki the other one, he said. Thank you, Naruto, Idate said, smiling. Naruto jumped off the dock and landed on the water's surface, then bit his thumb hard enough to draw blood before making some hand signs and slamming his right palm on the surface. Jutsu Summoning There was a puff of smoke before it faded, revealing Tylamon once more in the water, much to the delight of the onlookers. Ah Naruto-san, I see your mission was successful, Tylamon said. You're correct, and you could give us another ride to the other side, Naruto suggested. Of course, I'm always ready to do so, Tylamon replied. 
Naruto Sakura and Hanada waved goodbye to their new friends as they left the port for the hidden leaf village, after climbing on top of the Digimon's back. Phew. This mission was really something to experience, Naruto said as he sat down. You're correct, but you recovered the region as a result, Sakura said. I'm sure Hokage Gigi and Granny Tsunade would be delighted to see it again, she says. Naruto-kun. I just got a message from Fu-san and Ino-san that the latest Princess Gale movie is going to be released next week. Hinata looked up from her trans scroll to see Naruto and Sakura excited. The next Princess Gale film is coming out soon? I was wondering when they'd bring out the next one. Naruto exclaimed. Me too. Let's bring the others to the movie when it comes out, Sakura said. Be sure to tell the Digimon and I about the movie when you watch it, Tylamon joked. After that, the group continued on their way across the sea towards home without incident. That has to be one of the best Princess Gale movies I've ever seen. Fu exclaimed as she exited the theater with Naruto, Sakura, Haku, Hanada, and Ino. Naruto had invited the girls to watch the premiere of the latest Princess Gale film with him, and they had agreed without hesitation, even arriving 30 minutes before the show began. You're right, Fu Chan, despite the fact that it was just a movie, I was completely blown away, especially with that finishing move of theirs, Naruto exclaimed, with Haku giggling at his delight. You know I wish the movie had gone on a little longer, I could have watched that handsome Michi who played Sukeikuro all day long, Sakura said, then she noticed Naruto looking a little down before hugging him and kissing him on the lips, of course he doesn't compare to you Naruto-kun, this instantly cheered up the blonde. I'm curious about who does her wardrobe. I could definitely use some information on where she gets her clothes, Ino said. If I didn't know any better, Princess Gale is almost like a female Naruto-kun, Haku observed. Really, how? Naruto inquired. You both despise giving and are fiercely protective of those close to you. She's right, Naruto-kun, you both share the same ideals, Hanada said, making Naruto blush and rub the back of his head. Perhaps so, you know, if Princess Gale showed up right before us, I would totally ask for her autograph, Naruto said. I would have asked you to do that, Naru-kun, Kurama said, having developed an interest in movies as a result of Naruto's recent movie marathons. The group had arrived at a crossroads and were about to cross when a white horse galloped by right in front of them, but it was the rider who drew their attention. It was a woman with long black hair and bangs that swept down each side of her face, who was wearing pink eyeshadow and red lipstick. She was dressed in a green blouse over a pink jacket and brown gloves. Am I in a genjutsu, or did we just see Princess Gale pass by us? Asked Naruto, surprised. No, Naruto-kun, it was her. Fu exclaimed excitedly. Let's go after her and get her autograph. Exclaimed Chome, who was equally ecstatic. A group of horsemen dressed in grey armor and wielding weapons passed by in the same direction as Princess Gale. You don't think they're going after Princess Gale, do you? Ino worriedly asked. Hanada activated her by a kugan and remained silent for a few seconds before exclaiming, they're after her. Then it's clear what we need to do, Haku said, adjusting her battle kimono. Let's go save an actress. Said Naruto leaping from roof to roof with the girls close behind. Princess was currently racing through the streets, with the armored men closing in on her. One of the horsemen broke away from the group and ran down an alley to who knows where. The princess turned a corner when the same horseman appeared in the middle of the road and blocked her path. The man threw a net at her, but several shuriken flew through the air and sliced them to pieces. Everyone looked up to see a tan-skinned girl with lime-green wings fluttering quickly above them. You meanies, leave the princess alone. Fu opened her mouth, and yellow sparkling particles fell on them before flashing brightly, causing the horsemen to flail around blindly, until they heard a voice very close to them. I apologize for this, 
Then they felt pinpricks on several parts of their bodies where there were gaps in their armor before numbness and paralysis took over and they fell off their horses. They could barely lift their heads to see a black-haired girl wearing a red and green battle kimono who looked at them apologetically. Princess Gale rode down a long flight of stairs, pursued by the remaining horsemen, who were now led by a gray-haired man with a short ponytail and sunglasses. Two pursuing riders threw two bottles of slick oil ahead of her, which broke and spilled the contents. The princess was too late to avoid the oil because her horse slipped and fell to the ground, knocking her off balance. Get her. The man yelled, and the horsemen jumped off their mounts and pounced in a dogpile on Princess Gale, preventing her escape. We finally captured her, the man smiled with satisfaction. Suddenly, Princess Gale vanished in a puff of smoke, leaving behind a pink-haired girl who kicked and punched the assailants away from her. The next thing the man knew, he felt a heavy blow to the back of his head before falling unconscious. The men turned around to see a blue-haired girl standing next to their unconscious leader with another blonde-haired girl, which prompted them to flee in terror, but someone stood in their way, a very displeased Pinket. S-H-A-N-N-A-R-O-O They were all tied up and stripped of their weapons and armor before they knew it. What do you think you're doing, girls? A voice from above asked, and they all turned to see Kakashi squatting on a stone lamppost with Sasuke next to him. Kakashi Sensei, these men were pursuing the princess, so we stopped them, Ino explained. HMPH, Sasuke simply snorted, then Kakashi's body flickered forward and appeared among them as the ropes were cut, freeing the men much to the surprise and confusion of the girls. I'm really sorry, Kakashi said as he helped the man up from the ground. What's going on here? Sakura inquired, perplexed. Then Anko appeared with a body flicker, saying, Don't worry girls, I'll explain everything and then we'll go find Naruto-kun and the actress. Princess Gale was sitting solemnly on the bank of a lake where her horse drank when she heard someone land nearby and turned to see a young blonde with spiky hair and whisker marks on the cheeks, as well as a headband to indicate that he is a ninja. Are you okay, princess? You don't have to worry about those guys who were chasing you before any longer, because my friends and I took care of them, Naruto said with a foxy grin. You know, I'm a big fan of your movies, and so are my friends, so I was hoping that you would sign my woe. Naruto jumped out of the way as she mounted her horse and rode away from him, much to his surprise. What's with the silent treatment? Might as well go after her just to make sure no one else comes after her. Naruto held out the bracelet as he channeled Chakra into it, ride the wing road. He exclaimed, before summoning the air treks and skating after her. So, let me get this straight. Naruto-kun, Fu-chan, Sasuke-san, and I have been assigned to an escort mission, but what about Hanada-chan and Kurenai-sensei? Sakura asked, perplexed. She and the other members had been led to the location where the film crew had set up camp for the time being. Lady Tsunade had assigned another mission for them, along with Kiba and Shino, so Kakashi and I will lead the mission, Anko explained. Finally, I'm glad we're on a mission, Fu exclaimed happily. You're right, Fu Chan, just training in the village has gotten a little boring, Chomei said. I would like to introduce myself. My name is Sandayu Asama and I am the assistant of Yukie Fujikazi, whom you know as Princess Gale, the grey-haired man said, motioning to an elderly man with small squinted eyes behind a pair of blue glasses and wearing a brown sitting on a chair next to him, and this is Mr. Makino, the film director. Nice to meet you, and I have to say that you leaf ninjas are really something. You handled those stuntmen turned bodyguards we hired like it was nothing, and those were some big boys too, Makino said. Why thank you, Kakashi replied with an eye smile. In terms of the escort, the next Princess Gale film is the first one we're shooting abroad, and I don't need to tell you that the leading actress is a bit of a diva, said an orange-haired co-director. When the three men appeared, the girls couldn't stop themselves from squealing with delight. It's Michi, Kin, and Hidero. 
Princess Gale's co-stars! exclaimed Fu. Hurry up and get their autograph! exclaimed Chomei. Nice to meet you! We'll be heading to the Rainbow Glaciers, which is our final destination, Kin said. And that's where we'll film the scenes for the film's big climatic ending, Hidero explained. But isn't the land of snow a little far away for you to shoot a movie? Sasuke inquired. Sandayu recommended it. He said this rainbow glacier turns seven colors in the spring, the co-director explained. No, that's just an old legend. The truth is that there's no spring in the land of snow, Kakashi explained. Does that mean it's winter all year? Sakura wondered. Burr, it sounds like the people there never get to wear summer clothes, Fu shivered at the prospect. I recall you visiting the land of snow before, so I assumed this would be your second visit, Enko explained. Yeah, but it was a long time ago, Kakashi shrugged. I'm curious about Yukie. She sounds very different from the movies we've seen her in, Sakura said. The thing about her is that she has no faith in things like dreams and aspirations, Michi explained. But she's never been one to neglect her work. I don't know anything about her personal life, and I don't need to. As long as she's giving it her all when the camera is rolling, I don't have any complaints. Say what you will, but that woman is a natural actress. That's correct and she only started running away from the set when she found out we were going to the Land of Snow," the co-director explained. But first and foremost, we need to find her in order to continue the mission, Kakashi explained. During the chase, Naruto-kun pursued Yukie and I'm sure he's still near her, Sakura explained. In that case, I'll send a message to him via the trans scroll informing him of the mission, and he'll tell us where they are. Anko said before pulling out the scroll and beginning to write on it. So that's what's going on, we have an escort mission to the Land of Snow, Naruto said as he read the message on the trans scroll as he stood on a rooftop with the sun setting, he had been watching Yukie from afar as she always seems to try to lose him in any way she can. Perhaps so, but I don't like her attitude in the least, Kurama frowned. They had seen the actress treat the children poorly when they approached her for an autograph, which gave them a negative impression, especially since Kurama sensed a lot of negativity in her. Well, we need to keep our mission going, so I guess we should put up with it. Naruto jumped off the roof and walked towards a bar where he had followed Yukie and went inside, where he discovered her drinking sake like there was no tomorrow. She raised the cup to her lips and was about to drink when it was abruptly snatched from her grasp. She turned to see the same annoying blonde who had been following her all day. I think you've had enough, I know because I have a godmother who can take in a lot more than you, Naruto said as he set the cup on the counter. I know when I've had enough, and why do you keep following me? Yukie asked, a little tipsy. Apparently, I'm one of the ninjas hired to accompany you to the land of snow, Naruto explained. Well, you got the wrong job because I'm not going to the land of snow. Miss Yukie. Sandayu and the rest of his team arrived at the bar at that moment. Our boat to the land of snow is about to set sail, please, we don't have much time, they said. No, thank you. In fact, I'm bowing out as the princess, Yukie said, much to the surprise of everyone else except Sasuke. What are you on about? It's not a big deal. Lead actresses and directors switch from sequel to sequel all the time. That's enough. Listen to me, there's nobody on the planet who can play Princess Gale except you. Sandayu said sternly. If you pull out this late in the game, there's no way you'll ever be able to work in this business again. So who cares, Yukie said casually. Everyone was silent until Naruto spoke up, saying, I hate to do this, but there's no other choice. He walked forward and placed two fingers on a certain point of her neck before applying light pressure to knock her out, and Kakashi was there to catch her before she fell. They then all left the bar in search of the ship that would take them to the land of snow. 
It was a beautiful day as the ship sailed through the sea, and Naruto and the others watched as the filming crew moved various props and used a crane to lift much heavier loads around in preparation for the next scene's uptake. Is there anything else I should know about the mission, Kakashi-ni? Naruto inquired. Well, what I haven't mentioned is that this mission is an A-ranked mission, Kakashi replied, looking up from his orange book. An A-ranked mission? I don't see how watching over a spoilt actress would be that difficult, Sasuke questioned. There's a reason for that, big celebrities are frequently targeted for ransom, among other things, Enko explained. In the meantime, we should keep our guard up, Kakashi advised. Okay, Kakashi ni, Naruto said, nodding. Then they watched the director supervise a scene in which Princess Gale grieves over the apparent death of her close friend and partner Shishimaru and were quite impressed with her acting skills, though there was a minor mistake where Yukie forgot to put teardrops for the scene, so they had to restart, but nothing out of the ordinary. The co-director burst through the door into Makino's quarters the next morning, looking distressed. We have a problem, Mr. Makino. The yelling was enough to wake everyone on the ship, and they all gathered on deck, surprised to see what was the first thing they saw this early morning. There was a massive iceberg in front of the ship that was almost the size of a miniature island. What is that? Makino asked, echoing a similar thought shared by those around him. When I woke up this morning, this was waiting for me. We can't get through. What are we going to do? The co-director worriedly asked. Makino had a deep thought for a moment, then his eyes widened behind his glasses as an ingenious idea came to him. This is it. Everything is changing. He exclaimed. Huh? The co-director and the others were perplexed. You moron. Look, we're standing on the perfect shooting location. It practically begs us to film here. Wait. What? Remember this moment, the movie gods are smiling down on us. Everyone get ready to embark. Makino said to the rest of the filming crew. Naruto and Fu stood around a heater with Yukie to keep warm, all three yawning at the same time. Everyone took their positions a few minutes later, as the next scene was about to be recorded. All right, people, we're going to roll, so stand by exclaimed the co-director okay scene 36 cut 22 action ha 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 exclaimed a man dressed in a purple white and gold robe wearing a matching hat with a long feather attached to each side and wielding a two-pronged spear who is clearly the villain in the film it's you mao Yukie and her co-actors stood guard. Princess, please stay back. Said Michi, who was playing Sukeakuro. We'll look after him for you. Said Kin, posing as Brit. The villain, on the other hand, scoffed, Did you honestly believe that these meager fools would be a match for me prince? Then he performed an action as if launching a long-range attack when, much to his and everyone else's surprise, an unknown explosion above him, what's going on? Is this part of the script? Kakashi was standing in front of the actors with his arms stretched out, implying that he had thrown an explosive, while Anko stood next to him, holding a pair of kanai. What are you doing? exclaimed the co-director. Naruto frowned slightly as he channeled chakra throughout his body, knowing full well that both junins weren't doing this for nothing. Everyone hurry! exclaimed Kakashi. Everyone get ready, we've got enemies ahead of us, Naruto said, and the others took a kanai in preparation. Something burst out from beneath the snow at the sight of the explosion. It was a man with a long purple ponytail down his back, a mask-style forehead protector that framed his face, a blue and white ninja outfit, and gray armor on his left shoulder that connected to a gauntlet on his right hand, among other places. Welcome to the land of snow, friends, the man said. 
Kakashi's eyes widened in surprise as he recognized him. It's you. He exclaimed, then he looked to the left to see another standing on the edge of a cliff. Greetings Princess Koyuki. I hope you're still carrying around the hex crystal, she said, her pink spiky hair sticking out of the two holes in her helmet-like forehead protector like two pigtails. She was also wearing armor similar to the man except she had a wing-like backpack. Kakashi was surprised once more when he turned to look at Yukie, whom they referred to as Princess Koyuki. Do you know her, Kakashi? Anko inquired. Is there ever a mission we'd go on where there aren't any unexpected reveals like this? Sakura wondered. I can't say for sure, Sakura-chan, Naruto said. Makes me glad I came along, Fu said. Then someone appeared from their left, he was a large man with a short crop of purple hair as he also wears the same blue and white outfit, and similar except that he has a large metal arm attached to his left with a foldable red and purple snowboard, you're as good as they say Kakashi Hitaki and Anko Midarashi. Naruto, you and the others should protect Yukie while Anko and I deal with them. Everyone return to the ship. Kakashi ordered. Fubuki, Mizor, I'll leave the princess to you, the man said as he leapt from his perch. Very well then, Fubuki, the woman, said before jumping off hers as well. Kakashi and Anko dashed forward, meeting the leader halfway before squaring off for the upcoming battle. It's been a long time Kakashi, I hope you're not planning on fleeing like the last time, the man said. Nader Ryoga, Kakashi stated sternly. Let's reminisce later and get down to business, Anko suggested. Anko swung Kanai at Nader, but the snow ninja deflected the slashes with his gauntlet, and Kakashi was close behind with punches and kicks. Nader dodged and weaved his way around them, retaliating with his own. Striking Shadow Snakes Anko thrusts an arm forward as snakes shoot out of her sleeves and towards Nader, but as they approached, a purple dome appeared around Nader and shredded the snakes, much to their surprise, while Nader simply smirked. This may make things a little more difficult for us, Kakashi murmured. Meanwhile, Naruto and the group rushed in front of Yukie and the other actors as they prepared for the enemy. It's time for us to take the stage, so let's get this show started. Said Naruto, taking a fighting stance. You do that while I handle the girl, Sasuke said, running towards Fubuki before Naruto could say anything else. Darn it, Sasuke, grumbled Naruto. Mizor unfolded his back snowboard before dropping it on the ground, then hopped onto it and shot forward with a burst of speed towards Naruto. The blonde dashed to the side and threw a handful of kanai at Mizor, but the projectiles shattered when they made contact with the purple dome that surrounded him. Mizor returned and pursued the blonde once more. Flying Kick Naruto jumped into the air with his foot sticking out, and Mizor raised his metal arm to block the attack, resulting in a draw as they moved away from each other. Water Style Water Whip Fu performed a series of hand signs before grabbing a thin stream of water and lashing it at Mizor, but the water dispersed when it hit the purple dome as well. What's going on? It's like whatever we do keeps getting blocked by that barrier. Fu Chan. There's chakra running through their armor, which could be the source of that purple barrier, Chomei explained. If those armors can cancel ninjutsu, this is going to cause serious problems, Naruto said, having heard what Chomei said through the link. Ice Style. Sabama Blizzard. Fubuki waved his hand as a swarm of ice senbon in the shape of miniature swallows were launched. Sasuke cartwheeled to the right to avoid the ice projectiles, but they made a U-turn and aimed at him again. Fireball Jutsu Sasuke launched a continuous flamethrower to melt the ice, then he took out a foldable windmill shuriken and threw it at her, but it shattered as well due to the purple barrier. TCH, that armor is getting annoying, he said. Hurry back to the ship, quickly. Sakura yelled to the actors, who all ran to safety. Except for Koyuki, who stood there motionless. 
Yukie, what are you doing? Run. Sandayu dashed towards Yukie, calling her princess. Yukie turned to her manger, her eyes haunted. Ice prison. Fubuki yelled as large chunks of ice burst from the ground and headed towards Sasuke, who was constantly jumping backwards before launching another flamethrower, only for Fubuki to summon a chunk of ice to block the flames. Yukie trembled with fear as she fell to her knees, much to Sandayu's chagrin, and Naruto turned to see what was going on. Darn it, what's wrong with her? Naruto exclaimed. I'm sensing a lot of fear from her. Such emotions are associated with trauma, and it must have been triggered by her seeing the flames, Kurama explained. The enemy is attacking again, Naruto-sama! exclaimed Chinami. Naruto turned to face Mizor, who was leaping at him with an incoming punch with his metal arm. Naruto ducked under, but Mizor continued to punch and kick, with Naruto dashing and somersaulting backwards to avoid the strikes. Stand still, you little brat! yelled Mizor, steam bursting from his metal arm as it sped towards Naruto. Whoa! Naruto hopped backwards a little as he sunk into the ground and appeared behind Mizor via teleportation, then dashed forward and grabbed Mizor's head as he jumped before landing in a sitting position while driving his face into the ground to perform a one-handed bulldog, I'm sorry, he replied with a smirk. Keep that camera rolling even if it kills you! exclaimed Makino as he supervised the camera recording the battle between the Konoha ninjas and the snow ninjas. Show them the resolve of a cinematographer. But we'll need to live if we want the audience to watch this! exclaimed the co-director, shaking his head. With their backs to each other, Kakashi and Anko leapt away from Nadir. Kakashi, what's up with that armor of theirs? My jutsus just bounce off of it, Anko asked. It's chakra armor made by ninja in the land of snow, Kakashi explained. Are you aware of it? Yes, but it's a lot stronger than it used to be. So you remember? The armor increases the chakra within the body, strengthening a handful of the more useful jutsu. A chakra barrier surrounds us as well, able to deflect the chakra of our adversaries. As a result, ninjutsu and taijutsu are rendered useless, Nader said. Exactly, Kakashi said. Ice style. Dragon versus tiger. Nader demonstrated a pair of hand signs. Kakashi performed his own, water style, water dragon. Hand seals. Ice from the surroundings gathered to form a giant tiger, while water from the sea formed a serpentine dragon. Both constructs let out a roar before charging at each other. The ice tiger, however, completely froze the water dragon before shattering into pieces as Kakashi and Anko leapt out of the way, landing somewhere near Naruto and the others. If what they say about the armor is true, Kakashi ni, I'll need to bust out the hardware to turn this around, Naruto said. Naruto-sama, use the mobilates, Chinami advised. Got it. Everyone get close to me. Naruto called out to his teammates, who all responded by moving towards him. Okay, tag mode. Gokai change. There was a flash of light that faded to reveal Naruto and the others wearing a pirate-themed helmet and outfit, as well as having grown a few inches in different colors. Naruto wore red, Sakura wore pink, Anko wore yellow, Sasuke wore blue, Fu wore green, and Kakashi wore silver. This is your first time using any of your weapons, Oto Uto. Have fun, Kakashi said. Yeah, let's go, hit em hard. Said Naruto as he charged towards Mizor with Fu by his side, while Kakashi and Anko pursued Nadir once more, Sasuke pursued Fubuki and Sakura stayed back to protect Sandayu and Yukie. What difference does it make if you're also wearing a suit? Nader mocked. A lot actually, let me show you. Kakashi took out his cell phone like Morpher and flipped open the cover, 
then pressed a button on the belt buckle to reveal a white ranger key for him to take out and insert into the morpher before closing the cover, Gokai change. As the sound of a siren could be heard, his suit changed to one with a color scheme of white, gold, and blue. I'm right behind you. Anko took a yellow ranger key from her pocket, inserted it into her morpher, and twisted, Gokai change. Anko's suit changed into one with a saber-toothed tiger motif. As if changing forms will make any difference. Ice style. Dragon versus tiger. Nadir launched the ice tiger at them once more. Fireball attack. Kakashi grabbed the wrist-mounted device's throttle and revved it twice before holding his hands close together to form a highly concentrated energy ball and firing it at the ice tiger, which destroyed it and continued on to who knows where, much to Nadir's surprise. But how? He couldn't think because Anko was already on him and attacking relentlessly. Saber daggers. She yelled, pulling out a pair of yellow short-bladed daggers and stabbed and slashed at Nadir, who was on the defensive. She then threw one of the daggers at him, which he avoided by leaping into the air, but she smirked behind the helmet as she dashed forward with the other power dagger glowing with yellow energy before lunging at him with a diagonal slash that actually sliced through the armor, much to Nadir's surprise as he landed on the ground with a hand on the wound. How is this possible? He exclaimed, stunned. High Speed Fist From Kakashi's perspective, everything seemed to move in slow motion before rushing towards Nadir and unleashing a barrage of rapid punches before stepping forward and dealing a straight punch that sent him flying into an ice wall, his chakra armor dented all over as time returned to normal. Naruto and Fu were charging at Mizor, who was riding his snowboard in their direction. Let's double team him, Fu Chan. He said, pulling out his morpher and a red ranger key. You got it, Naruto-kun. Fu exclaimed, pulling out hers and a white ranger key. Both inserted and twisted their keys before exclaiming, Gokai change. Naruto changes into a ranger with a lion's motif and golden claws on his gloves, while Fu changes into a white suit with a tiger's motif and golden claws on her gloves. Why you little brats? Mizor lunged at Naruto with a straight punch of his metal arm, but Naruto caught it before easily catching the second one. Fu stepped behind Mizor and performed a leg sweep, knocking him to the ground, before grabbing him with one clawed hand while Naruto did the same on the other side. They began to run on all fours like beasts, dragging Mizor along the ground before tossing him away battered. Lion Fang Naruto called up the Red Lion-themed gauntlet in his left hand. Tiger Baton Fu called out, holding a white tiger-themed baton in his hand. Mizor stood up and aimed the metal arm at them before firing a retractable cable arm. Naruto dashed to the side and grabbed the cable with the lion fang. Come over here. Naruto yanked on the cable, attracting Mizor's attention. Take this. Fu exclaimed as she swung the tiger baton at the side of his head, sending him flying in the direction of Sakura. It's your turn, Sakura-chan. Sakura moved in quickly to intercept, Gokai changed. Sakura changed into a pink suit with a short cape and a butterfly motif, Magipunch. A pair of red boxing gloves appeared in her hands, Sakura reared a fist back as Mizor approached, S-H-A-N-N-A-R-O-O. -O. She thrust it into his gut, sending him flying away and crashing into a cliff wall. Currently, Sasuke was firing his Gokai gun at Fubuki, who was darting left and right to avoid the incoming energy projectiles. Ice Style. Sabama Blizzard. Exclaimed the Snow Kunoichi as he launched another volley of ice swallows at the Uchiha. HN, Gokai change. Sasuke extracted a blue ranger key from his belt buckle and inserted it into the morpher before twisting it. Then he transformed into a ranger with a blue and white color scheme, saying, blow knuckle. And summoning a blue gauntlet resembling a jet turbine to appear in his left hand. Sasuke fired the weapon, 
causing a strong gust of wind to blow away the icy projectiles and knock Fubuki backwards. Lucky shot, ice style, ice prison. She exclaimed as she hurled ice chunks at him. Sasuke pointed the blow knuckle to the ground and fired another gust of wind to launch him high into the air and out of range of the attack, Sir V Buster. He drew a sidearm in gun mode from his belt and fired lasers at Fubuki, a few of which broke through the ice barrier she had formed around her and inflicted significant damage on her, Sir V Blade. Then he twisted the handle straight. Fubuki's eyes widened as the pack opened up for the wings to unfold before flying high into the air and away from Sasuke, who frowned behind his helmet. HMPH. Coward, muttered Sasuke under his breath. I don't know how you were able to bypass the power of our armor, but this fight is far from over. Mizor and Fubuki were retreating. Ice style. White Whale Jutsu. Groaned Nadir as he stood up from the ground and glared at Kakashi and Anko. The ground began to shake violently as a long narwhal horn burst out between them, revealing a massive whale made entirely of ice, which began to fall towards Kakashi and Anko, who quickly hightailed it out of there before reverting to their base forms, Gokiger. In that case, we might as well do the same thing. Everyone back to the ship. Kakashi exclaimed. Naruto and the others rushed back to the ship, carrying Sandayu and an unconscious Yukie, if that's her real name, as it sailed away from the iceberg. And cut. Makino exclaimed before the crew stopped filming. That has to be one of the most incredible scenes we've ever recorded, the co-director exclaimed. You're right, but I have a feeling we haven't seen anything yet, Makino said, his eyes twinkling. The suits had vanished on the other side of the ship's deck after their use, and Sandayu carried Yukie back to her quarters to rest, leaving the Konoha ninjas to argue among themselves. Kakashi ni, it appears that you know that Nader guy and Yukie much better than we thought, would you mind telling us about it? Asked Naruto, quirking his brow. I will, but we'll need to gather everyone to talk about it. I have a feeling that some of the things I know might be related to them. I have to admit that those weapons of yours are very powerful, which makes me a little jealous," Kakashi said with an eye smile. Perhaps you should start dragging me along on your missions so you can use them again, Naruto smirked. It was also a lot of fun. Fu exclaimed excitedly as she hugged Naruto from behind. The boy blushed slightly as he felt two soft mounds pressing against his back, turning him into a stuttering mess as the girls around and within giggled at his awkward moment. Naruto-sama, I must inform you that the bracelet has awakened a new power, Shinami said. Naruto raised his hand to inspect the bracelet, which had five small silver rings attached to it. He grabbed one that glowed briefly before falling off the bracelet, and he noticed that he could latch it back on the same way. What are these rings for, Shinami-san? Wondered Naruto. I'll explain later, Naruto-sama. For now, rest before we learn what Kakashi-san and hopefully Sandayu will explain to us, Shinami said. She's right, Naru-kun, we've had our fill of excitement for the day, Karama said. All right then, Naruto said as he walked towards his quarters to prepare for the journey and the potential dangers ahead. Following the battle with the snow ninjas on the giant iceberg, the Konoha ninjas and the film crew continued on their journey to the land of snow. There was some tension among the film crew members, but Mr. Makino, the film director, was quite pleased with himself for capturing an actual ninja battle on camera. Kakashi was in Yukie's sleeping quarters at the time, watching her sleep deeply. He then turned his attention to the item in his hand, which happened to be a hexagonal, purple stick with an indent at the bottom and a key hook with a string to make it a necklace. 10 years. Been it's a long time since I've seen you, Kakashi reflected as he gazed at the sleeping girl, before the door opened to reveal Sandayu behind it. The ship just pulled into the dock, Sandayu said. All right, I'll be right over, she says. 
Before placing the necklace on the table and walking out of the room with Sandayu to the room where his team, Mr. Makino and his co-director, were waiting for them, the filming crew was gathering their equipment and modes of transportation, which were trucks with skis in place of tires to move on the snow. So you met one of those snow ninjas some time ago, Kakashi Ni, and who Yukie really is, Kakashi Ni. Asked Naruto as he sat between Sakura and Fu, with Sasuke on the far side of the table, and Mr. Makino, the co-director, and Sandayu on the other side, with Kakashi and Anko choosing to stand. You're correct about that, which leads me to ask, Kakashi turned to Sandayu, as did everyone else, you've known about this all along, Sandayu, haven't you? Sandayu confirmed with a nod, yes. Didn't you ever think about what might happen if she ever returned to the Land of Snow? Of course, you're correct. But this was the only way I could think of to get the princess to return home. Do you mean to tell us that Yukie is a real princess and not an actress? Sakura inquired. That's right, Yukie Fujikaze is just an alias. We're actually guarding Princess Koyuki Kazahana, the rightful heir to the Land of Snow's throne, Kakashi explained, much to the surprise of everyone in the room except Sandayu. Well, that's another record for my resume, Anko said quietly. I met her a long time ago, I was her aide when she was a little girl. I don't blame her for not remembering because it was years ago, Sandayu explained. That means you were also from the Land of Snow, Sasuke explained. You're right, Sasuke-san, I served the princess's father, the former clan leader Lord Sosetsu Kazahana. The Land of Snow was not a large nation, but it served as a haven of peace. Lord Sosetsu, he absolutely adored the princess. Ah those were idyllic times, Sandayu smiled in nostalgia before his expression changed to anger. But ten years ago, on that cursed day. Lord Sosets. It was during that time when I was in the Land of Snow when I rescued Princess Koyuki, but I knew there was no way we could defeat them. We had to keep running. We had to get away, Kakashi said. This is even worse than when Gato took over the Land of Waves, Naruto grumbled. We heard about that during our travels, then we heard that Gato was overthrown and the Land of Waves rose back to prosperity again, they even named their newly constructed bridge, the Great Naruto Bridge, and I bet you and your team were involved in it, Makino smirked at Naruto, who rubbed the back of his head. I was practically beside myself with joy the day I discovered that our princess was alive. She was alive after all these years. Sandayu sobbed loudly, with everyone looking on in understanding. The people of the Land of Snow must have adored the former lord and his daughter, Kurama smiled. It demonstrates how well he ruled the country, Chinami said. I should have died back then, he says. Everyone turned to see Koyuki, who was leaning against the open door with a frown on her face. You mustn't say such things, princess. We feared the worst. You have no idea how frantic we were. We never stopped praying for your life, Sandayu said. I'm alive. But my heart is dead. Any tears I had left dried up after that day, Koyuki explained. And that's how I became the manager for Yukie Fujikaze, I had bided my time waiting for the day I could escort her back to the Land of Snow, Sandayu said, wiping his eyes with a handkerchief. So you're saying you've just been using us all this time? Asked the co-director, looking betrayed, while Makino remained silent. I apologize for deceiving you. But it was for the sake of the people of the Land of Snow, Sandayu got out of his seat and approached Koyuki on his hands and knees. Confront Doto and take your rightful place as leader of our country. I will give up my life without hesitation to protect you. Please. Take up arms and lead your people. Everyone remained silent as they awaited Koyuki's response, which they eventually received. I don't think so, Sandayu looked up in surprise as Naruto scowled. Kakashi took note of this and silently hoped that the blonde didn't lash out even though it was inevitable. 
But what about your people, princess? I couldn't care less about them. Just forget about them, she says. But princess. Sandayu began, but was cut off. Will you just give up already? Don't be a moron. Whatever you do, you will never be able to get rid of Dodo, okay? Sandayu was about to cry again when Koyuki yelled. Naruto rose from his seat and fixed his gaze on Koyuki. What's the deal with you? Do you think Sandayu-san is going to stand there and watch his friends and family suffer like that? He's willing to give up his life because he has complete faith in you, and yet you're abandoning him. If this is who you truly are, it is pointless to protect someone who could care less about their own country. Koyuki returned his stare, and what do you think? My father was murdered because of Dodo. How would you know what it's like to lose a parent? The Konoha ninjas looked at Naruto with a worried expression on their faces and one thought in their minds, oh, please, not those words again. How could she say such a thing to Naruto-kun? Only I could get out of this seal. My tails would smack her across the sea. Karama screamed angrily. Karama-san, please calm down, Chinami said calmly, despite her own anger. You're right, I wouldn't know how it feels to lose a parent to death. Naruto bowed his head, you're right, I wouldn't know how it feels to lose a parent to death. Koyuki smiled smugly, thinking she was right. Because mine died on the night I was born, but it quickly changed to shock as she looked into his blue eyes, unlike you, who spent a significant amount of time with your father, I never got to spend even a single day with mine. But, unlike you, I didn't lose sight of who I truly am. The room was silent, Makino, the co-director and Sandayu looked at Naruto in awe, Kakashi looked at the ceiling in sorrow at how Naruto never had the opportunity to be loved by a family, Anko, Sakura and Fu glared at Koyuki in anger at how she hurt the one they loved, Sasuke looked at Naruto while feeling a sense of kinship since they're both orphans, and Koyuki simply stood there not knowing whether to be angry or ashamed. As long as there is hope, one can dream, and with those dreams comes the future, Makino said, as everyone looked at him puzzled. I like it, it's the perfect theme for our new Princess Gale movie, he added. But, Mr. Makino, are you really going to keep filming with everything that's happened? Inquired the co-director, concerned. The director just smirked, as I previously stated, the film is evolving. Consider this. How often do you get the chance to make a film with a real princess? We're looking at a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity here. Makino's clarification gave the co-director a look of realization, consider the buzz. Even the making of, will be a hit. We've got a sure-fire blockbuster on our hands. Koyuki, on the other hand, objected, now, hold on a second. Unfortunately, there is only one option. Running is no longer an option now that Dodo is on our tail, Kakashi stated. They'll be sure to come at us more seriously after that battle with those snow ninjas, Anko predicted. I'll be looking forward to it, smirked Sasuke. Stop playing games. Koyuki yelled angrily, movies aren't real life, there's no such thing as a happy ending in this world. Yes, if you are willing to fight for it. Makino replied, effectively silenced her. Normally in these circumstances, I would return to the village for a little assistance, Kakashi explained. But we've come too far, and backup would take too long to arrive, so we'll have to manage things on our own, Naruto explained. Thank you all so much, Sandayu said gratefully. That's it, we're moving forward with this image. Makino stated. And you can bet that this one will end happily. The co-director agreed with me. You can rely on us. Fu was overjoyed. Ditto. Chomei stated. Koyuki simply stood there with a frown on her face, watching them. Later, as the group was driving along the ledges of a tall snowy mountain in the land of snow in the five customized trucks, Naruto, the co-director, 
and a film crew member went to stand near the edge to take a leak. Our hideout is not far away, just beyond this cave. We'll pass through to the other side once we finish shooting here, Sandayu stated. All right, but we can't let our guard down, Kakashi said. Of course, my people will be able to rest easier once their princess is returned. If she's willing to cooperate, snorted Anko. They resumed their journey, passing through the long, dark tunnel. This tunnel is quite long. I can't even see the way out, Fu said as she looked out the window. Once upon a time, there was a railroad that ran through here, Sandayu explained. A railway? So, trains used to come through here? Sakura inquired. That's correct, but it's now hidden beneath ice pillars. However, if you dig deep enough, you will be able to find them. That's interesting, Naruto said. Naruto, I've been meaning to inquire about the bracelet with the five rings attached to it. Everyone's attention was drawn to Kakashi's question. I was told that the bracelet had activated another power known as party mode. What about party mode? Fu was perplexed. Shinami-san told me that these rings are linked to the bracelet and have the power to summon a weapon to the wearer without requiring me to be nearby to use tag mode, Naruto reached for one of the rings that glowed before falling off the bracelet and held it out for them to see. Do you mean we can summon any weapon with one of those rings? That sounds very convenient, Sasuke stated. Yes, but there is a catch. You can only summon one weapon at a time and the ring selects the bearer based on their battle style or the situation. I can also track their location and communicate with them via radios. That's all well and good, Naruto-kun, but what if one of the rings is stolen? Anko inquired. In that case, I can return the rings to the bracelet, Naruto explained. So, how does one go about using one of the rings? Sakura inquired. All you have to do is channel chakra to the ring and call out, equip, to summon a weapon, Naruto explained before removing the remaining rings and handing them to the team. Mr. Makino emerged from the leading truck as the film crew members prepared to record their next scene, a few minutes after the trucks finally exited the tunnel and parked nearby. Okay, folks, let's get this show started. Makino stated. Suddenly, the co-director jumped out of the second truck and ran towards him, a distressed expression on his face, Mr. We've got a problem here, Makino. What exactly is it? Yukie has risen and then vanished. What? Anko appeared irritated, that girl is grating on my nerves. I'll go look for her. I should be able to track her down, Naruto said. Okay, Naruto. We'll stay here to protect the others, Kakashi said, and Naruto nodded in agreement before running back into the tunnel in search of the errant princess. Koyuki was currently running as fast as she could through the snow-covered pine forest, away from everyone, they can forget it, I'm not going back to that place. To that man. She stepped on the snowy ground, which turned out to be much deeper than expected causing her to trip and tumble down a hill before coming to a stop and closing her eyes as she lost consciousness. If you look closely, you'll see the future, said a man in the darkness. I can't see anything, said Koyuki, who sounded much younger. Of course you can. When spring arrives. You will. Is it spring? You're a liar father. No there's spring in this land. Koyuki said as an adult. Koyuki slowly opened her eyes, then felt hot air blow through her hair and looked up, only to let out a terrified gasp before scrambling backwards. It was a wolf covered in blue, white, and silver-colored fur about twice the size of a horse, with three strands of fur growing from the tip of its shoulders. Koyuki then saw someone stick their head over the wolf's head and recognized who it was right away. Thank you for assisting me in finding her, Geruruman, Naruto said. It's not a problem at all, Naruto, the wolf said. Naruto? What or who is that? Koyuki inquired. 
Geru Ruman is the name of one of my summons. I summoned him to assist me in finding you by following your scent all the way here. But, seriously, how can you keep running away from your problems when they'll follow you until you decide to face them? With a quirked brow, Naruto inquired. HMPH, Koyuki muttered as he walked away, causing Naruto to roll his eyes. Come on, everyone is expecting us. Koyuki climbed onto Geru Ruman's back and wrapped her arms around Naruto's waist, and despite his irritation at her attitude, he couldn't help but blush from feeling two soft mounds pressing against his back as they made their way back through the tunnel. Why are you always looking for me? Koyuki inquired. Because it is my duty to accompany and protect you. So, no matter how much you despise it and flee, Geru Ruman and I will undoubtedly track you down, Naruto stated. He's right. Once I catch a whiff of your scent, there's no way you'll be able to avoid me, Geruruman said. You can drag me back, but I'm only going to act in front of the camera, Koyuki said. Hey, whatever you say, Naruto chuckled. They were startled to hear a sound echoing through the tunnel from behind them, followed by the sound of ice cracking, and turned to see two railroad lines parallel to each other appearing from behind them and moving ahead of them. Railroad tracks? But I thought they were frozen over, as Sandayu san stated. Naruto stated. Everyone outside the cave was surprised and perplexed when a pair of railroad lines appeared from the tunnel and into the mountain. What exactly is it? Makino inquired. Sandayu dashed towards a railroad line and knelt to inspect it. It's chakra, there's chakra running through the rails and melting the ice. His eyes widened in surprise, it has to be him. Everyone hurry, you have to get out of here. It's not safe to let them find you. Then he proceeded to run up a snowy hill, much to the consternation of everyone around him, except the Konoha Junins, who understood what he meant. Get the crew to safety and out of sight, Sasuke, Sakura, and Fu. We have enemies on the way. Kakashi stated. Roger, sir. Before beginning the task, the three genins nodded in agreement. Back in the tunnel, Naruto, Koyuki, and Geruruman could see a bright light and hear the sound of metal approaching them. I think it's... A train, Koyuki expressed concern. If what you're saying is correct, we should leave right away. Let's go, Geruruman. Naruto spoke urgently. You've got it. Geru Ruman turned and dashed down the tunnel as fast as he could. When Koyuki looked over her shoulder, her eyes widened in terror as she saw a train with three blaring headlights chasing them down both railroad lines. Hurry, it's closing in on us. Koyuki exclaimed. We can't help ourselves. Naruto responded. We'll never get there. This is not the time to give up. This is pointless. We're done. Then you don't know me very well. I'd rather die doing my best than giving up. Geru Ruman shares the same ideal and will demonstrate what I mean. Koyuki was taken aback when Naruto declared, Come on Geru Ruman, run like the wind. Geru Ruman pumped energy throughout his body, which glowed with a blue aura then accelerated and began to pull away from the speeding train as they approached the exit. That's all there is to it, buddy. We're almost there. With a smirk, Naruto said. Geru Ruman leapt away from the railway lines, skidding on the snowy ground before coming to a halt just moments before the train rushed past them, and Naruto wiped the sweat from his brow in relief before turning to smirk at Koyuki. See what I meant when I said I would never give up? Naruto said with a sly grin. One of the reasons I pledged my loyalty to you, Geru Ruman said with a grin that revealed his fangs. Koyuki could only look at the blonde in surprise before realizing her hands had wrapped around Naruto's chest and she could feel the firm abs before letting go and getting off Geru Ruman's back before turning to look at the train that had stopped not far from where they stood. It's been a long time. Koyuki. A male voice could be heard over the train's loudspeaker. 
I knew it. Dodo, it's Koyuki's eyes widened in terror as she recognized the voice. A brown-haired man dressed in royal robes stood on the first cart with Nadir by his side, speaking into a microphone. It's been a decade. Don't be shy, let's take a look at that face, Dodo stated. Naruto moved to stand in between them, Geru Ruman growling at him. I've heard good things about you, Naruto Uzumaki Namikaze. The weapon master of Konoha and the son of the fourth Hokage. Pleased to meet you, Gato the second, Naruto replied sarcastically as Koyuki looked at him in shock of his family background, and she wasn't the only one as the film crew members who were hiding and recording were as well. He's the famous Yellow Flash's son? So when he said those words. I'd gone too far back then, Koyuki pondered. Large rows of cut logs and waves of snow slid down the slope and slammed into the middle cart of the train, causing everyone to turn to see a platoon of men dressed in samurai armor and wielding swords and spears, among them Sandayu, who was also wearing armor. Sandayu exclaimed emphatically, Men, our beloved princess Koyuki has arrived to keep an eye on us. Victory is ours with her by our side. The warriors roared in agreement with his declaration. Those must be some of the people rebelling against Dodo, Shinami speculated. But what they're doing is practically suicide. They'll only kill themselves, Kurama explained. I'll make sure that doesn't happen, Naruto thought, his bracelet glowing and ready to summon a weapon. Do you hear me, Dodo? We've been waiting for this day of reckoning for a long time, Sandayu Asama, and fifteen loyal warriors stand before you to avenge our great fallen leader, Lord Sosetsu. You will not be able to breathe on this day. Sandayu stated. I thought you destroyed the last of the insurgents, Dodo snorted, disgusted. Please accept my apologies. We'll get rid of them right away, Nader said. No. Little there's they can understand other than total annihilation with men like these. Attack. Sandayu led the men down the slope to attack Dodo, but several compartments on the carts with snow ninjas manning turrets opened up and prepared to fire. Naruto's eyes widened as he realized what was going to happen and he bolted, I don't think so, you cretin. Henshin, Henshin. Naruto instantly flipped the horn on his belt, transforming into common rider Kabuto in rider form rather than the default masked form. Beetle change. Time to go. He then swiped his belt side. Current time. Then he vanished from view of everyone watching, and the snow ninjas fired a large volley of kanai at high speed straight at Sandayu and his men, but before any kanai got close to hitting any of them, something seemed to be deflecting each and every one of the deadly projectiles, much to Dodo's surprise and the confusion of the warriors opposing him. Geru Ruman saw this as an opportunity and dashed forward in between them, cannon of ice. He opened his mouth to launch ice balls at the snow ninjas guarding the turrets, then turned to face Sandayu and his men, ice wall. Before exhaling frost to form an ice wall, thus barricading them. What are you up to? Sandayu inquired. Stopping you from running to your death is noble, but this act is simply martyrdom. You would have all been killed if it hadn't been for Naruto and me. Geru Ruman became enraged. End of time. Naruto reappeared on the other side of the ice wall, this time with the Kanai gun in gun mode, aiming the firearm at the train as energy charged up at the muzzle, avalanche attack. Then he pulled the trigger, launching a large white energy sphere that collided with one of the carts, resulting in a large radius explosion. Naruto watched as the locomotive quickly detached from its carts in order to flee, before deactivating the armor and rejoining the others. By then, Kakashi and the others who had been planning an attack prior to Naruto's intervention had appeared, along with the film crew. You crazy old fool, what you almost did was suicide, especially against Shinobi. Anko yelled angrily at the group. She's right about that, and in front of the princess no less, Kakashi added. 
I truly apologize for all of this, for putting my men in such danger, Sandayu said, looking ashamed. Naruto dashed up to them, is everyone okay? Yeah, good thinking, using the armor's ability to defend the men, Kakashi said with a smile. What would you expect from our Naruto-kun? Anko hugged the blonde from behind, rubbing her cheek against her, making the girls and, surprisingly, Koyuki jealous. I shouldn't have come after all, you almost got yourself killed because of me, Koyuki said. Don't blame yourself for this princess, Sandayu said. But then what, you wouldn't have attempted this if I wasn't here, would you? Koyuki demanded angrily, while Sandayu remained silent. Before they could say anything else, a blimp rose from beneath the cliff behind them, and Mizor was standing at the opening, his metal arm aimed at them before firing a retractable cable arm that managed to grab Koyuki by her robe and pull her towards the blimp. Princess. Sandayu exclaimed in surprise. Fubuki flew by them and threw a handful of kanai with blue crystal orbs attached to them, just as the Konoha ninjas and Naruto's summon were about to move in to bring her back. Naruto and Sasuke threw several shuriken, deflecting most of the kanai and unleashing torrents of ice spikes with enough force to lift large amounts of earth off the ground. Damn it, they're fleeing! Angrily exclaimed Anko. I'll be going ahead, Garu Ruman will stay with you guys to track me. Said Naruto before biting his thumb to draw blood and performing several hand signs, summoning jutsu. He slammed a palm on the floor then a puff of smoke cleared to reveal a giant bird with red feathers and a white head with a pair of gigantic horns growing from it. Hello Naruto, Garuruman, how may I assist you? The bird inquired. Hello, Aquilamon, I need your assistance in pursuing that blimp, Naruto said. Please climb on my back and we'll be on our way, Aquilamon said. Okay then. Naruto said to the others, I'll meet you guys later. Okay. Naruto-kun, please be cautious, Sakura said, with Naruto nodding in agreement. Then he jumped onto Aquilamon's back before taking to the skies in pursuit of the blimp, thinking to himself, I told you that I'll definitely come after you, Koyuki, so you better expect me to show up. So that's it for today, I hope you guys enjoyed it. Don't forget to like, share and subscribe to the channel for more awesome stories like this. Thank you. See you all in my next video.